Michael Muller considers himself a perpetual migrant. He started traveling when he was five years old. He says, home is where my pillow is. <laughs> and I usually do not miss locations and places, I miss people. This is what I read in an interview of yours, and I hope it kind of mirrors and reflects your personal attitude. Absolutely. Michael Muller comes with almost 40 years of public service, international public service. At this time, he serves as Under Secretary General of the United Nations. He is the Director General of the United Nations Office, Geneva. And what people usually miss on your current responsibilities, what they miss out, you are also the Secretary General of the Conference on Disarmament at the United Nations in Geneva. And in that capacity, you also serve as the Secretary, General, Secretary General's personal representatives. Michael Muller holds various degrees in political science, University of Sussex, uh, Johns Hopkins. One aspect that I found intriguing is you're not just working in Geneva, but you have already brought home a few awards for what you have been doing for the city of Geneva. It's not something that you would easily expect from an expat, you know, to <laughs> basically commit himself to um, fostering, supporting, enhancing Geneva International. And as that, I, as a Swiss taxpayer, thank you very much for, you know, it's kind of the, the kind of thing we, we hope for and we don't always get. So you've been awarded the Médaille Genève Reconnaissante and the Prix Fondation de Genève. Uh, very remarkable and chapeau on that. And that's about that. Um, when perusing on YouTube, I read that you're genuinely interested, and you have been genuinely interested in art. Mm -hmm. um, Baladini, one of the pieces of which we're very proud at the University of St. Gallen, integrated art. Wherever you go, you kind of overlook art at St. Gallen because it's so very inconspicuous in many places. But um, I guess it's, it's worthwhile uh, mentioning Perosa. Um, Cerosa, pardon me, the, the architect who built this library building. So much about the brief introduction. Thank you. According to plan, I hand it over to you and invite you to uh, offer an input on the topic. Thank you very much. Um, talking about art, I did a little detour um, coming here and looked at the Giacometti uh, sculpture. Who's, uh, he's my favorite uh, sculptor. And, uh, you know, it's... The, the art enriches our lives in a way that uh, most of us don't really realize, and we're doing a lot of that as well in, in the Palais, which is an invitation to all of you to come and visit. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's really a pleasure to be in St. Gallen. We were just talking about the fact that this is my first time here, which is a bit bizarre because I've been coming and living in Switzerland on and off since 1979, and uh, I should have been here much earlier, but better late than never. Absolutely. Um, also, before I start, I, uh, I, I, I was here since this morning and I uh, sat in on an absolutely fascinating uh, speech or lecture by uh, Mr. Rifkin. Um, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to tell every one of you who wasn't there today to look at it online. It's very complimentary to what I'm going to say. Um, he says it a lot better than I can, um, but it's absolutely a must uh, to, uh, to, to, to listen to if you want to understand <clears throat> where we're going as a planet. Uh, he has some extraordinary insights mm. and also some good advice to all of us. So I would suggest that you spend a little bit of your afternoon or evening to, to read it, uh, to listen to it. So um, to set the scene for our discussion today, and I hope it's going to be a discussion, um, I thought I'd sketch out two ways of viewing the world today. The first version, which we can call the pessimist's view, 
takes its cue from the news headlines, the images of human misery, of violence and chaos, despair and disaster that we encounter every day without respite. The second version, which I, is mine, and which I call the optimist counterpoint, shuts out the noise of the 24-hour news cycle and looks beyond the day-to-day -day at the underlying data. What it uncovers is, an, uh, is a world not on the brink of collapse, but a steady cumulative progress. So what I'll try to do is to show with this juxtaposition is not that one viewpoint is right and the other wrong, but that they are complementary. They illuminate different parts of the broad canvas that are, is our complex and very contradictory world today. If we consider both versions together, we can deduce insights, we can develop responses, and we can take action. We may, in a word, be able to arrive at something that is alluded to in the title of what we agreed on with uh, your colleagues for what I'm saying today, which is humanity's to-do list for a better future. So let me start then with version one, the more somber and darker, the pessimistic view. You turn on the, view, the news, and there's plenty to make you despair. Conflict and war, poverty and hunger, violence and hatred, bigotry and racism, it all seems pretty overwhelming at times. Then there are the larger, the global, the existential threats that we face. Above and beyond everything, climate change. For all the threats we face, this is the one that will define the nature of this century more dramatically than anything else we have to face. Today we are spending a little more than an hour together. According to the data from the World Bank and the World Wildlife Fund, in this single hour, four million tons of carbon dioxide will be emitted. 1,500 hectares of forests are going to be disappearing, and three species will go extinct. During this hour, the pollution that already exists in our atmosphere will trap as much heat as would be released by detonating 16,600 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs. This is just in one hour. And the impact of all this is clear and undeniable, as the latest report from the World Meteorological Organization and my colleagues in Geneva just confirmed. 17 of the hottest years ever measured have been since 2001. And the three hottest years were the last three ones. Millions of people and trillions of assets are at risk from extreme droughts, fires, floods, hurricanes, and rising seas. Climate change is a direct threat in itself and a, multiple, and a multiplier of many other threats, from poverty to displacement to conflict. What, conf what uh, compounds the challenge is that all of the above, poverty, displacement, conflict, obstructs action to address climate change. It's hard to ask people who are struggling to find enough to eat today to worry about what happens to the planet tomorrow. Worrying about climate change for many is a luxury that they cannot afford. But climate change threatens everyone, everywhere. We don't have a plan B because there is no planet B. Yet, it is those who have contributed the least to this threat that are living with the greatest damage paying the highest costs and suffering the gravest loss. This means that inequality and climate change are mutually reinforcing. So to resolve the latter, we cannot ignore the former. Neither are being addressed at a fast enough rate today. In fact, in some senses, we may actually going to be going in reverse. Last year, 82% of the wealth generated went to the world's richest 1%, according to a new Oxfam report. The world created new billionaires at a rate of one every two days, nine-tenths of them men, by the way. In the past, we were often, often told that we should tolerate inequality as a way to achieve greater prosperity for all, that the rising tide lifts all boats, that it would all miraculously trickle down somehow. Well, the huge 
increase among the, fur the 1 percent could actually have ended global extreme poverty seven times over. But instead, the nearly 4 billion people who make up the poorest half of the world saw no increase in their wealth over the last decades. Entire regions and countries failed to catch up to the waves of progress left behind in the rust belts of our world. 10% of the world's population live on less than $2 a day. But poverty is no, by no means exclusive to the developing world, which is a fallacy many of us still think. In fact, even here in Switzerland, home to four of the world's 10 cities with the highest quality of life, more than half a, billion, uh, half a million people live under the poverty line. Many citizens feel abandoned, leading many of them to conclude that, may, that banks may too big to fail, but I am too small to matter. Exclusion has a price. Frustration, alienation, and instability. Inequality catalyzed by technological disruption that further tilts the distribution from labor to capital is creating a dangerous seedbed for discontent. It stretches the fabric of our societies to the breaking point. It undermines trust in the institutions that govern our society, fanning the flames of populist outrage. In fact, the, the rise of populism relies on this sense of crisis, of being left behind as faceless forces, imprecisely described as globalization, liberalization, or technological disruption, destroy a glorious past that no one really ever experienced, but that everyone now claims to remember. It is true that in many developed economies, the United States and Western Europe in particular, the younger generation no longer expects to be better off than their parents. Having entered the job market in the wake of the Great Recession, millennials on average earn less, own less, and face higher job insecurity than their baby boomer parents. But the question remains, were things really better in the past? And we can approach this question by way of a short hypothetical. If you had to choose one moment in history in which to be born, and you did not know in advance whether you were going to be male or female, which country you were going to be from, or what your status was, which time should you choose? The answer is really at the heart of what we can call the optimist view of the world. Why? Because I think that you would have a hard time justifying choosing any other than the present. Because if you chose today, in most places you would be less likely to be living in poverty, less likely to be illiterate, less likely to confront intolerance and oppression, and less likely to die of diseases or be killed in a war than at any time in human history. Much of this incredible story of progress has happened in the past seven decades, and much of it can be attributed to the extraordinary international structure that was built after the Second World War. Not just the UN, but also uh, all our partners. With a few exceptions, poverty has been reduced more in the last 50 years than in the previous 500 years. Data by the IMF shows that the average Chinese person is 10 times richer today than he or she was just five decades ago and lives for 25 years longer. 90% of all scientists that ever lived are alive today. And our scientific understanding of the world is more advanced today than it ever was. And to understand the unprecedented pace of progress in our lifetime, just consider this fact that Mr. Rifkin also alluded to this morning, that the cell phone you have in your pocket has more computing power than the Apollo space capsule that landed the first humans on the moon in 1969. Meanwhile, you would have to go back hundreds of years to find a similar period of great power peace. According to data, compiled by an Oxford economist called Max Rosso. The number of people who have died as a result of war, civil war, and yes, also terrorism, is down 50% this decade from the 1990s. It is down 75% from the preceding five decades, the decades of the Cold War, and it is 99% less from the decades before that, which is World War II. And progress continues as we speak. I mentioned before how much harm we inflict on our planet in the span of 60 minutes. But within that hour, it is also true 
that the number of people who live on less than $2 a day actually goes down by 9,000 every hour. That every hour, 12,500 people gain access to clean drinking water around the world. And this is just a few examples. So what do we make of all this? One can paint a plausible picture of the world on the brink of collapse, but you can equally sketch out what we might, that we might just be living in the best of times. And I would draw three insights from that. First, that the challenges we face are real, existential, and among the most dangerous we've ever faced. But nothing, not climate change, not technological disruption, not inequality, is independent of human action. We are the masters of our fate. Our actions matter. And this means that, secondly, we have the ability to resolve them. The point of the incredible stories of progress in our recent past is that we have reasons to be optimistic. Not blind optimism, but hard-earned optimism rooted in very real progress. Thirdly, any action that we take in order to rectify all the wrongs that we are facing right now must be global and universal. We simply cannot successfully deal with the multiplicity of challenges we face either sequentially or in isolation. The interrelation of, of challenges produces intricate causalities. Public outrage over social injustices or a lack of trust in institutions can prove just as explosive as more conventional triggers for military conflict. To prevent conflicts, we need a holistic approach focused on root causes. Geopolitically, the last couple of years are generally narrated as a breakdown of global collaboration. Tensions rose, conflicts deepened, and protectionism resurfaced. In recent months, you will have seen pundits declaring the return of the Cold War. A return with a vengeance, but with a difference. For the mechanisms and the safeguards to manage the risks of escalation that existed in the past and during the Cold War seem today to be fragile and porous if they exist at all. And all of this is true, but it's only part of the story. I miss the background noise of Bellico's rhetoric. The 193 member states that make up the United Nations actually agreed on something truly groundbreaking two and a half years ago. They agreed the most ambitious development agenda in human history, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This agenda is a logical, necessary conclusion from the three insights I just outlined, human agency, optimism, and universality. The 2030 Agenda constitutes universal recognition that the challenges faced by any one of us may swiftly become crises faced by all. Carbon emissions know no boundaries. Distant conflicts lead to refugee flows. A weak healthcare system in a remote island state can lead to worldwide pandemics. The 2030 Agenda grasps that these challenges cannot effectively be met by tinkering around the edges of economic, social and political governance, but require a fundamental shift in the dominant development model in all countries. With 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs for short, as you know, and 169 specific targets, we now have a detailed global roadmap of what needs to be done we have, in fact, humanity's to-do list for the future. The goals address everything from ending poverty, goal one, achieving gender equality, goal five, to decent work and equitable economic growth, goal eight, to the rule of law, goal 16. These are just a few. And all of these, all 17 of them, are anchored in three very fundamental principles, and that are the game-changing principles that member states actually agreed on against all odds in many ways. One, they are indivisible and universal and interrelated. Two, they are crafted in such a way that if we manage to implement them, we will leave no one behind. And three, they are everyone's responsibility, every single one of you in this room. We used to uh, come up with policy frameworks and then left it up to our governments to deal with them, and we called them every Christmas to figure out how they were doing. That is no longer working. We all have to be part of this uh, solution. And if we do, achieving these goals will create a world that is comprehensively sustainable, socially fair, environmentally secure, economically prosperous, inclusive, and more predictable. 
So, so far so good. We all know, though, that writing to-do lists is one thing. Actually doing them is an entirely different matter. So the question is, how are we doing in our quest to make the 2030 agenda a reality? The answer is not quite clear-cut yet. We're in the third year, since 2015. On the one hand, the ways in which the agenda has become a common roadmap, the ways in which it has given new structure and direction to our work across disciplines and geographies, um, has been nothing short of incredible. We can talk a little bit about that later if you want. At the, the beginning of this year, for example, I, uh, I attended the World Economic Forum in Davos, and in previous years, you, some, you sometimes and often had political officials in one corner and industry executives in the other, exchanging pleasantries, having a drink, but really running on separate agendas and pretty much having two different languages that didn't always coincide. Now, and this year, the SDGs have actually built a sort of linguistic bridge a shared language for all of us to really come together to meaningfully explore how to solve the challenges that affects us all. This translates, uh, certainly in my mind, that there is a clear change in mindset. A new spirit of collaboration and partnership that simple, simply wasn't there in the pre-2030 agenda. And that is true in all parts of society. I'll give you a small anecdote that, uh, I, that I, I used to describe the change that is happening within the UN system, which has always been seen as a kind of siloed uh, structure, the same as in every government. Um, and it has been so with different organizations doing their job, but not really talking to each other as much as they should. And uh, when one of my staff came to me and said, look, we've just realized that the senior most staff, that's a really top level staff of over 30 organizations, are getting together privately once a week to sit and discuss how they can collectively uh, put together the individual expertise that all of these organizations have in a much more effective implementation of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, as Peter said, uh, Christoph, sorry, said, um, been in this business for almost 40 years and I've never seen things like that happen, which really gave me a, my a mini epiphany that there is a, a, there's a very profound um, uh, mindset change that is happening that is uh, very positive. Still, um, this spirit of partnership still needs to embed itself more firmly in the structures and the instruments we have to implement policy. And I am also, in spite of the good news story I just told you, also talking about um, the United Nations and the structure. Um, it's clear that, um, and I'm not telling you a secret, the geopolitical landscape and reality that gave rise to the UN 70 years ago has shifted dramatically in ways that some of us are only beginning to understand now. Um, all we have to do, for example, is to look at the distribution of power globally, uh, now and, and uh, then and now. We used to have pretty much a bipolar world with controlled confrontation between two superpowers, and which has now metamorphosed into something much more diffuse. Internationally, mid-level powers act increasingly autonomously from the big powers. Domestically, the state's monopoly of power is challenged by non-state actors. Cyberspace is mostly privately owned and operated by huge corporations. And even within governments, mayors of cities can sometimes be as influential, if not more, in making policy as prime ministers or presidents. So in this polycentric system, or multi-stakeholder system, or whatever we're going to end up calling it, the United Nations as a structure, is, which is still firmly built around the notion of the nation state sovereignty, has to become much more nimble and open to uh, other actors in order to, re not only to retain its relevance, but certainly to become um, impactful and, uh, and have uh, the required means to, to actually help the, move, the, the, the world move forward. Particularly at a time of f great fragmentation as we have now, where governments and countries and peoples are closing their doors, pulling up their bridges, building walls, um, at a time when uh, global solidarity is needed more than ever, um, the only structures really that can create the bridge, um, uh, not just between these old systems of governments and the new ones, but also between um, the past and the, and the future, is really these structures that were created 70 years ago. 
uh, a reform, in a reformed manner, they need to be reformed, but still they have the human capital and the experience and the expertise accumulated over these years to actually um, help uh, uh, the world move uh, into, a, into where we need to be. One of the great structural problems that we have today um, is the gap between the short-term political systems and the long-term solutions that we need to apply to the problems that are in front of us. And that gap is not getting smaller, it's getting bigger. And this speaks to leadership and uh, all of this stuff, but we can talk about that as well. So, this is not to say that the messy power relations of the 21st century uh, international politics does not engender tremendous opportunities, particularly, as I said, if it's approached through the lens of the 2030 agenda. If you, uh, if uh, sort of the you win, I lose type of calculations dominated Cold War area, and zero sum game, um, international relations, the SDGs are really the paradigm shift necessary for uh, this new polycentric system that does away with these zero sum games. The new logic is simple and very powerful. If the threats are existential, if power is dispersed, and challenges are global and interlinked, then we really are all in, in this all together. And no one wins unless everyone wins. So let me plug Geneva a little bit, since you mentioned it. And Geneva, which is our European headquarters, is really at the vanguard of that change. Um, the really quite extraordinary ecosystem that has been built in Geneva over the last 150 years, uh, starting with the creation of the Red Cross, fuels collaboration, innovation, and the sharing of knowledge. We have over a hundred international organizations. We have somewhere between 400 and 500 non-governmental organizations. We have representatives of 179 states. We have a really private, a vibrant private sector with over 1,600 multinationals having offices there. And we have world-class academic institutions um, at the same level as yours here that I'm sitting in. So this proximity and this ecosystem enables partnerships whose impact is felt across the world. One of the phrases I use when I speak is that there is not a single individual on this planet, all seven point something billion of us, that is not touched every day by something that emanates from Geneva. What is equally true that it is that it has never been easier to uh, get involved in our collective efforts to make the world a better place. It's also never been more necessary. This is really no time for bystanders. Rights are universal. Responsibility tracks power. This means that uh, as individuals, small everyday actions can be meaningful. As businesses, the bar is a little higher. And I'm mentioning business here for two reasons. First, because we're in St. Gallen, and all, uh, after all, and among us here in this room are very likely tomorrow CEOs, managers, and entrepreneurs. And secondly, I'm mentioning business because the private sector will be perhaps the most critical actor in deciding what will prevail, the pessimist's fears or the optimist's dreams. And this is no exaggeration. The outcome of virtually every, every challenge we face will in part be decided by actions of private companies. Take inequality and the instability it engenders. If a majority of companies follow the flawed premise that quarterly profits, margins, and shareholder value trump their responsibility to the society in which they operate, the social compact that holds society together will break. Take resources and the way in which we are deployed, they are deployed. According to some estimates, the, to actually achieve the goals set by the 2030 Agenda, we need a minimum of $2.3 trillion in investments per year. That is a low bar. Some people talk about up to $7 trillion. Investments in, in green infrastructure, in energy, in agriculture, in health, in education, etc. Clearly, public funding is not going to come up with that kind of money. Not even close. So, in the meantime, trillions of private capital remains locked up in bonds, earning low or marginal returns. Deep and liquid capital markets remain concentrated in New York, London, and Hong Kong, while entrepreneurs in the developing world struggle to find funding to grow their businesses. So we need businesses of all sizes, from startups to corporate, to innovate market-based solutions that drive inclusion, to do business in a way that works for the, the global good as much as for the bottom line. If irresponsible business can do tremendous harm, 
responsible business also has the power to deliver enormous progress. In fact, a business approach is often more sustainable and scalable than a charity. By working with African farmers, for example, to improve coffee production, companies like Starbucks or Nestle can lift more people out of poverty than any number of aid efforts can. Among the biggest corporations, there is at least now more of the right kind of talk and thinking. Lawrence Fink, the chief executive of the investment firm BlackRock, and one of the biggest investors in the world, made waves the other day with an implicit threat to punish small-minded companies, and I quote him, if you only deliver financial performance without a positive contribution to society. So there's a mindset in the business community as well that's happening, and very welcome. And you can just compare what I just quoted with the statement of the consequential economist Milton Friedman, who three decades ago wrote, and I quote him, there is one and only one social responsibility of business, and that is to increase its profits. It doesn't work anymore. So what's drive, but however, what, uh, also when you look at it a little bit closer, this change that's happening, what's driving the rethink is not necessarily just the tinkling of, uh, of the tycoon conscience, it's really self-interest as well. It's born out of the recognition that uh, sustainability is not only the right thing to do, it's a smart thing to do. And the data tells a clear-cut story. Businesses that put sustainability at the core of what they do and how they do it outperform those that don't. They outperform because sustainability gives them the compass and perspectives to take the long-term view. They outperform because sustainability connects them to the zeitgeist. And they outperform because if they're innovative enough to go sustainable, they are nimble enough to navigate volatile competitive markets. And here is what I find most encouraging about the change. It's driven by the next generation. It's driven by most of you in this room. Doing good is no longer a matter of writing a few checks at the end of the year as it was for my generation and those before me. For many young people today, it's an ethos that governs where you work, where you shop, and where you invest. Some of it may be shallow, some of it is deeper, but it's certainly authentic, and that gives a lot of hope. For the years and decades to come, we'll test our civilization like no other. You are the first generation that can end extreme poverty, and you are the absolute last generation that can curb climate change. It's a pretty heavy responsibility. And the future will depend on the commitment, the ingenuity, the curiosity, the abilities, the sense of common destiny, and the empowerment of every person on the planet. It will depend on you, and it will be depend very crucially on your determination and capacity for transformation and for reform. We face a stark, cho uh, a stark choice. If we cling to an economic and social model that drives exclusion and environmental destruction, people die, opportunities are missed, the seeds of division and future conflicts are sown, and the full force of climate change becomes ever day, every day more likely. Or we create another world where open trade is more collaborative, where financial systems are safer and more supportive of broad-based growth, where gains are distributed fairly, where the digital revolution benefits not just the fortunate few, but lifts the fate of the many, and where companies care about all their stakeholders, not just their shareholders. We have a to-do list. So let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Sorry for being long. You're forgiven. Thank you. <laughs> Does the dark, pessimistic side of the story ever hit you personally? Does it ever get to you? Yes. In my daily life, I meet a lot of stupidity. And that's when it hits me. And How then I get to work. It? I try to change mm -hmm. their minds and maybe come with some facts that prove that uh, there are other ways of looking at it. And in any event, I wouldn't be in this job if I wasn't an optimist. Well, thank you for a most remarkable um, talk. You have given us a tour d'horizon um, of black and white 
full of fire, but in a very sober demeanor. Um, I will start questioning you for about 10, 15 minutes before we open the floor. What I will do is um, basically address each level of abstraction, starting with the very concrete, going through a meso level, asking you something about Africa, sustainable development in Africa, and um, ending with perhaps one of the most basic questions that we are looking at. But to start with the concrete situation of the here and of the now, we are in a very privileged setting. Most of the people in this room have never been facing the kind of horror that you've been, no, not horror, but the kind of misery that you have been um, addressing, such as poverty, lack of perspective, um, no positive prospect whatsoever. Sustainable development goals at a very abstract level, but we need to break it down because you did mention each and every one of us has a responsibility. So first question, you are at you know, a very prestigious business school, grand visions, um, really privileged in just about every possible way. What is your hope? What is your demand? when looking at our students. What, you know, how can they contribute to what you're talking about when it comes to the Sustainable Development Goals? And please feel free to include the teachers as well, because we... Well, the answer to your question is at two levels. One is the issue of mindset change that I mentioned before. We have to really think outside the normal box that we all find ourselves in. And this is quite deep. It's, a, it's an existential uh, mindset change. We, the way that we look ourselves in the greater scheme of ourselves as individuals and what our responsible responsibility is to, um, to the society in which we are, whether it's big or small, the community we live in. Um, and also um, the, how we look at our responsibility and how we live in our daily lives. Um, I didn't bring it, but I'll send it to you. I, we came out with a little um, booklet that I'm distributing to all the visitors that come to the UN and to schools and wherever I come, which is called 170 Actions. And it's 10 suggestions per development goal that is addressed to each one of you. What can you do in your daily lives? And it goes from the very simple daily stuff to the more broad and intellectual. Um, the first thing you do is to turn off your water when you brush your teeth in the morning, for example. These kinds of things, very practical things that uh, addresses the issue of climate, that addresses the issue of our environment. Um, and then uh, the way that you educate your children, the way that you educate yourself, the way that you... Uh, so that's on the existential level, I think there's quite a lot to do. Uh, that goes to um, your call to say, tell something to the teachers because it goes to how, you, how you're going to be teaching, um, both the students you have now and those you're going to have tomorrow. How are you going to... Uh, uh, how are they going to learn uh, to position themselves in a way that will um, both um, be, make sure that their lives are fulfilling and rich, but at the same time a part of saving our planet for our future generations? Um, I think that it's a big question that is being discussed here in the, these couple of days. How are we going to uh, recalibrate our educational system um, to... Uh, uh, to adapt to a very uncertain and, and a future. Um, we keep being told that uh, 50 or 70 percent of all the jobs we know today will no longer exist 20 years from now, but we don't quite know what the jobs that we're going to see are there. So what does that mean for our educational systems? How are we going to calibrate it? The answer for me is clearly lies in making sure that the values um, on which we have built our society and on which we will continue to manage our planet have to be um, brought back to life. Um, we have seen the last decade or so a walking away from these values and the norms that uh, have uh, governed the way we manage our planet. That's very dangerous. Can we teach values? We can certainly teach which values are there and then you can, you can give the tools to every single individual to be able to make an informed choice of how to, which values is right for him or her um, in the context of the society where she lives in. It's clear that values are different in different parts of the world. But there are some universal values that need to be uh, polished on again, I think. Then, so I can go on for, that, for a long time on that, but then there's a practical aspect. Uh, how do we actually 
um, individually make sure that, uh, that these goals are being implemented. And one of the things that I'm seeing um, is really very hope-inducing. Um, because that question, I'm asked that question all the time, including from kids that are less than 10 years old that come and, and I speak to. The question is not no longer what are these SDGs, the question is what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. And I think that there, there is, uh, it's, it's, it goes from the very micro to the macro. It depends on what you're going to, how you're going to structure your life, what kind of uh, job you're going to be going for, what kind of education you're giving yourself. It depend, it's also how you educate your children, etc. But there are, in our daily lives, actions that can be taken um, that, are, um, that will help us doing so. We need to recreate a global solidarity that has kind of evaporated over the past several years. It's per patently clear that uh, the, the problems that we face cannot be solved by any single country, any single organization. It has to be a collective effort. We are only going to make it as a planet if we work on it together. It's pretty clear, as far as I'm concerned. And that clarity has to dawn on everybody, because once uh, we see that happening, then the actions will go on as well. And it's happening. It, I, I just gave you a little anecdote about how my own colleagues are, are, are reacting in a very different way than they used to. But I see it in the business community. I have major corporations that are coming to us to ask advice on how they can be part of, uh, of uh, the implementation of these goals. Non-governmental organizations that are completely changing their focus and their, their business models. Um, academics, we are, we are working very hard with the academic community, uh, particularly the research community, to make sure that we align the research that is being done now and in the future to the needs on the ground, so that what is done at the research level actually feeds into improving on the way that we implement the different goals that we have. And that is working very well right now. We're just uh, in the process of creating a new initiative in Geneva where um, cutting-edge um, uh, research, uh, scientific research, is going to be married in an institute with, um, uh, with the operational actors to make sure that that conversation is constant and sustained um, in order to have a much greater impact. And in fact, I would, end, I would probably submit also much more interesting for researchers because they're actually going to do something that really has an impact in real life. So, um, I have a tendency to go on. You have to stop me uh, because I'm sure there are other questions. Um, I'll stop here on that one. Cheers. Um, question two. Africa, 40, 50 and 60 years into development assistance and 40, 50 and 60 years into they need help and 40 and 50 and 60 years into a lack of genuine progress when it comes to sustainable development goal number 16, which is strong institutions, not strong men, but strong in institutions. Um, how do we see and how do we foster, how do we support change when it comes to development assistance? Because if we don't manage to change things, for example, in that region, we're going to have more of what we have you know, seen in the last few years, migration, forced migration, economic migration. How do we manage and how do we bring in the private sector, perhaps, in, you know, bringing about change when it comes to... Yeah, so first of all, let me uh, take a little bit issue with your dis description of Africa. It's not all bleak. Five of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are in Africa right now. Let's not forget that. There's a lot of uh, progress. Uh, the narrative on Africa for the past many decades has been consistently negative. It's a black hole, sorry for the pun, but uh, uh, where, uh, that only breeds uh, war and misery. And clearly there still are many places that are a problem. But there are also many places that are doing extraordinary things and have leapfrogged um, uh, their development. Just look at Rwanda with all its problems in terms of human mm -hmm. rights. But Rwanda is now, I think, the third easiest country to do business in if you want to start a new business. Um, and has done extraordinary things and is using, is using technology to leapfrog. So I think that both in terms of, um, and we, there's lots of work being done on, on, uh, on improving on the governance structures, on improving on elections, on the democratic uh, structures that they have, and the democratic habits that are a little weak in many places. But there is progress. Uh, that, what needs to be done is to uh, help them accelerate that process and to bring to bear 
um, the collective ability of those who have it uh, in a much more structured way and a less politicized way. So I'll give you an example of some of the things that we're doing just to, to, to show you what can be done. Um, I've created a little unit in my uh, office called the SDG Lab, which was created in order to uh, be a service center, if you want, for many of these st stakeholders and actors who have something to do with, uh, with, uh, with implementing SDGs around the world. And also to make sure that uh, we capture information, we capture best practices. Because there are so many in initiatives popping up every two minutes everywhere that we needed a way of capturing all this. And, um, and to do so in a very practical way, not just talk about the SDGs as we're doing today, but actually do it in a practical way. So last year, in a chance encounter, I, I met a very quite fantastic fellow who is uh, from Niger and who is the um, a special advisor to the president with the rank of minister. And he had uh, come up with a plan to wire. Now, Niger, as many of you know, is really at the bottom of the development food chain. I think it's second from the bottom. They need help with everything. So anyway, they decided that to leapfrog their development position, they were going to wire 15,000 villages with electricity and with the internet giving the, the villagers a completely different world in terms of education, in terms of trade, in terms of health, in terms of help with their agriculture, in terms of practically every aspect of their, uh, of their, uh, of their daily lives. Um, but they had a problem in trying to figure out how to do it and who to talk to and who could help, etc. So I brought this fellow to Geneva and I put him in touch with our ecosystem. With, uh, uh, and we have something called the 2030 ecosystem in, uh, that we have built with over 200 actors, UN, non-UN, uh, NGOs, governments, everybody, all of whom come together once a week to figure out how they can work better together to, uh, to, uh, to implement these goals. And so I, we put him into that room. And the result of that is pretty miraculous because what is happening uh, is uh, we actually, and this is what I'm trying to do with this example, to prove that a collective, integrated, collaborative approach to these problems actually has a major impact, way beyond what we would do if we use a sort of old-fashioned slight salami system where we go to one and two different actors. So this project is now off the ground, and I am hoping that if the next two or three years we can prove and we can show in real numbers that um, the level of Niger's um, development has increased by considerable factors, um, it will have been, uh, it will be a great success. Just if I, if I may kind of challenge you on this one, yeah. um, you know, we have been listening and, and, and heard for such a long time that yes, there is a different Africa that's really uh, making uh, giant leaps forward. But demographically speaking, we're at 1.2 billion uh, people in Africa. And within 80 years, we're looking at 4 billion people in Africa. Nigeria, uh, over 1 billion people in Nigeria alone. So we need jobs. Sure. We really, really need jobs. So much more specifically, how can, or how, how does the UN see its role yeah. in, in that realm? So first of all, uh, we need to be much more focused on addressing the root causes. Uh, I'll come to the, you know, the, the, the demographic issue in a moment. But the root causes of, of, all of the, a lot of the problems that are there, I mean, you know, if we had been smarter at addressing these causes, we would not have a Central African Republican problem mm -hmm. or a Mali problem, or we w and we certainly would have a much smaller Nigeria problem, which is a huge problem right now. Um, so we need to be better, smarter, at more focused intervention and be more, much more preventive. And this is one of the, 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 the bedrocks of the new um, reform proposals that our new Secretary General has put forward to member states and is being discussed as we speak here in New York and hopefully they will give the green light. How do we become, how do we go much more upstream and use a considerable amount of knowledge, expertise, and money that the world has to address these causes before they become a problem in a much more, uh, in a much smarter way. That together with the private sector is going to also create the jobs that are needed to, uh, uh, to, 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 to move forward and to make sure that a lot of these people prefer, who all of them, prefer to stay at home. I mean, if you think that uh, most of the people that are flowing out of Africa or in any other part of the world, Syria, etc., all the places, they're not going because they want to leave home, they're going because they need and they don't have anything to eat or they're getting killed or they're getting persecuted, etc. 
So, um, so I think that there, here is exactly where the combination of uh, the private-public partnership uh, on, uh, on steroids mm -hmm. uh, between the business community, both the local and the international, um, and the UN system in a, in a collaborative way that we haven't quite seen before in operational terms is already being put in place in many places but needs to be, uh, as I said, to charged and, uh, and work. We are now, for example, doing... Um, so this breaking down of the silos, um, another example is, um, is an interesting example of the World Bank and the political machinery of the UN working together for the first time in Yemen. And, and they're using Yemen as a test case, which is probably one of the most difficult places to operate right now. Um, and with some quite uh, good results, given the really fraught situation in which uh, they're working under bombs with uh, 20 million people in need of food aid, etc. But nevertheless, uh, we are beginning to see some progress there as well. So there are answers. They need to be expanded and accelerated. Um, and this is all. And this is clearly also where, as I said, the business community, who is more and more uh, picking up on this, both in the development area, in the climate area, in the humanitarian area, uh, who want to be part of uh, these solutions to a much greater degree than they are now. And it's a it's a it's a mindset change there as well, which is driven by the realization that it's good business to be uh, sustainable and to have the right attitude. But also because there is a there is also a human mindset change as I, I see in many of them. Mm -hmm. I'm, for example, doing a lot of work with uh, with um, uh, Salesforce, big software mm -hmm. company in the states, who are totally va value based uh, business um, in terms of how they deal with their staff, how they deal with their profits, how they deal with their works, and um, I'm seeing more and more of this happening. Let me come to the third question, my last one. Highest level of, ex of abs abstraction. If we tried, or if we had to define what perhaps is the most successful principle of political organization in modern times, my hunch would be it's the sovereign nation state. It's been incredibly or remarkably successful in so many ways producing public goods on a regular basis, peace, security, uh, wealth, you, you name it. For the last 30, 40 and 50 years, the nation state has been undermined in many different ways. Globalization in general, and now the most recent manifestation of globalization, of course, is what we call digitalization, with data being transnational by dint of its very, of the very nature. So my last question is the e an easy one, of course. Is the nation state still the vehicle, the political, the, the, the organizational principle that we can rely upon when it comes to tackling the challenges that we face? The likes of George Kennan and Hans Morgenthau in the 1950s, they would not and telling us, not ever stop telling us, that with nuclear, the nation state has basically seen the day and that we need something else. You know, now with the digital coming or add, being added to the nuclear, is the nation, nation state still, you know, obviously it's a thing, it's the best we ha we've got, that is clear. But should we not be much more innovative and bold in trying to seriously think about new forms of social organization? Or would you say, no, 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 we need to be pragmatic and just stick to what we have? So the answer to your question about whether the nation state is still the organizing principle uh, is no. It's not, but it's not, that doesn't mean that the nation state is out the window. It just means that it's going to be more and more one of the actors around the decision-making table. I think we're seeing that already. But it's a, it's a difficult time to ask that question because we are in very much in a transition phase. We are transitioning between the old Westphalian system of governance where the, 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 the nation state was central in the, in the running of the affairs of the citizens to a much more polycentric um, way of running things, multi-stakeholder, etc. But we are in this very difficult situation where the old system is still there in a defensive way in many places, asymmetrically important. 
and a new system that is not defined yet, not structured, and certainly not legitimized yet. Uh, so we are between two chairs. And when you are between, between two chairs in governance terms, usually nonsense happens, and that's pretty much what we're living right now. And we will continue to live. It's very clear, though, that we are moving, clear to me at least, that we are moving in that transition away from a purely state-driven system to a much more polycentric system. And there are plenty of examples of that working, but there are examples in very um, uh, specific situations, in, in health, in vaccinations, for example, or in education, um, where a polycentric uh, multi-stakeholder system has worked incredibly well. Those of you who know Gavi and the Global Fund, who are actually the two organizations that vaccinate um, the most people on the planet every day, they are both um, uh, polycentric systems that work incredibly well. The best, the best gauge of success I can give you is, a, is a, in a few words, is when last year the Global Fund was doing its replenishment. It collected $13 billion in a week. There is no other organization that has been able to do that. <coughs> and the only reason why it's doing that is because it's it, it works, mm -hmm. it functions. So now what we're seeing is a scaling up of these experiences into something much broader. And, um, uh, and it, the very interesting aspect of that, and it brings me back to the, to the sustainable development goals, is that th these goals have pushed governments, certain amount of governments, particularly in the South, to completely rethink the way that they manage the affairs of the state and the, the way that they, they provide the, um, uh, the services to the citizens. And I'll speak in a moment about cities, which are very important actors of this. But, you know, places like Costa Rica, um, Colombia, India, um, Rwanda, etc. In Costa Rica, the government sat down and signed a compact with the business community, with the civil society community, um, on how to implement these goals, who was going to do what and how and together with whom. A very different concept. And this whole of government approach, which uh, demands um, that the governments work in an integrated way, in a, the, dependent, if you want, to the breaking down of silos in the international system, is being more and more adapted uh, and is being seen as the only way to actually be able to implement that. Because if you think that you can just deal with health without making a connection um, to gender, to education, to uh, climate, uh, you're not going to make it. And neither of these, they're completely interrelated. So the structures are changing organically, if you want, and, um, and we're going to see uh, how that uh, plays out. I think that what we're going to see, and then this here comes in the cities. Cities as, um, as uh, the places where citizens get their services are more and more important. 75% of the world population is going to live in cities by 2050. 63.5% of the whole Latin American continent lives in cities already. Mm -hmm. That completely changes the way we manage our affairs and the affairs of citizens, how we provide health, how we provide uh, uh, schooling, uh, how we provide transport, uh, how we do agriculture, etc. So cities are going to be more and more important. And the next level are the regional organizations and the regional arrangements, not necessarily organizations. So we are going to see probably in the future a, a, a different kind of governance structure that is going to be much more uh, uh, grounded in uh, what's happening at the, at, the, at the grassroots level, where really it's where it counts, um, but clearly where the big ticket items, um, like climate, like health, like corruption, like finance, um, uh, defense, is going to be dealt with probably in regional arrangements at the first level and then globally at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, at the organizational level. Um, this brings me, for example, to um, and to speak a little bit about uh, the structures of the UN as well. Um, you know, most countries have a saying that uh, uh, rotting fish starts smelling from the head. If you apply that to the UN, it means that we really need to have a hard look at the Security Council. Security Council, which uh, was created 70 years ago um, as the main responsible entity for our peace and security globally, doesn't work any longer, as it should be. It was created in a reality that is not the reality of today. Um, but it was created by states for states. So 
So we have a structural problem in which we are needing to tell those states who sit there, and particularly those who have a, a, a veto power, that they have to give up part of the power in order to, for the common good. We've tried to, to, uh, we've tried to reform it for the past 25, 30 years. It has been a completely sterile discussion that has led absolutely nowhere because we keep trying, or member states keep trying to reform it in the image of the past and not really looking at the needs of, to, of today and tomorrow. Mm. Um, so that doesn't work. I'm adding a few countries uh, is, is not just going to make it more unwieldy, less representative, uh, etc. So we need to find a system and completely think differently of how we're going to structure that um, so that it is more representative, it's more nimble, it takes into account other issues than just peace and security issues when they, you look at the problems that are presented for them, which means social, economic and cultural, which they don't do particularly well right now. Uh, so, and, you, and, the, and the very basic insight of this is that unless we do this, we are not going to be recapturing the trust that we have lost as an institution. Trust, we haven't talked about that, but trust is a massive problem today. People don't trust each other, they don't trust their institutions, they don't trust uh, you know, the store next door, they don't trust the police. They don't. We have lost trust and we have to capture it again. And the only way we do that is by proving that we're effective in providing the services to the citizen that they need and that they demand. So in order to do that, we need to figure out another way to do it. We, I can speak about my ideas on how this can be done, but that, I extrapolate from that also to the organizations. We have to find a much more mm. matrix way of managing our affairs, which means that we have to completely rethink the structure of the international uh, machinery on how we provide uh, humanitarian aid, development aid, um, uh, climate stuff, you know, trade, uh, etc. The UN Security Council does not work. We need to regain trust. Um, remarkable words on the part of a UN Secretary General. Good to truth. hear. Thank you. <laughs> We have about half an hour left, and we kindly, or I kindly invite you to be curious and come forward with your question, questions, and I see it's not going to be difficult. <laughs> Why don't you just start? We, are we taking one at a time or several at a time? Um, I suggest that we take one at a time, okay. because otherwise parts get, tend to get lost. No problem. Right, well, first of all, thank you very much for your insights. It has been very intriguing. Who are listening you? to you, I'm Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Studying here, business at HSG. Um You said earlier that you encounter a lot of stupidity, <laughs> and um, I imagine this must be quite frustrating, especially if it comes from, let's just say, Donald Trump. Maybe um, I was wondering specifically. Um, you don't have to comment on that, but I was wondering okay. specifically how you engage with people like him who, who try to, you know, I mean, we have seen his reactions to the climate change deal made by the UN and his Iran deal just recently. How do you try to convince people like him to work alongside the UN and to, to pull at one string? Well, first of all, let me say that um, Mr. Trump is not a one-off. He's a multiplier of a trend that existed already. If you look at uh, just the Europe itself, uh, we have quite a number of problematic leaders. If you look at Asia, the same, and Africa. Uh, it's, a, it's a sign of one of the times right now, and it comes back to what I was saying before about this transition period we are in the governance where uh, people have lost trust, where uh, we have uh, an inequality that has uh, reached completely unsustainable levels. Eight men owning more than half, uh, more than the bottom half of humanity. Um, is not sustainable. Um, so there's, uh, there is, uh, there's a lot of anger and a lot of justified anger that we need to deal with. We have a lot of the solutions um, and um, how to deal with these kinds of things, is, uh, these kinds of people and these kinds of trends is to prove that they're wrong by reasoning and by discussing and by um, talking about it. I want to remind you of the uh, original purpose of the United Nations, why it was, was created. First of all, it was created in order to make sure that we never again had a world war. But it, in doing so, it actually provided a table around which everybody can sit down, big and small, green, blue, red, whatever color, rich and poor, um, and including people who didn't agree, in order to come to some sort of understanding and agreement on how we're going to run our affairs of this planet. 
we have uh, some countries are walking away from that right now, but they are going to come, have to come back, pressed by reality. Reality always imposes itself, sooner rather than later, and it's happening right now as well, with all the big ticket items that we were talking about. We have a sector journal that has been extraordinarily adept and good at uh, engaging with the new American administration. I don't think anybody could have done it better. He's a very fine politician. He was a politician before. And I think has minimized some of the original impacts that we were f fearing uh, when we heard the, the narratives um, in the beginning, uh, even before uh, the election. Um, it's clear that there are impacts, uh, certainly budgetary impacts, particularly on certain items. Um, the decision, for example, to cut uh, mass massively the funding for UNRWA, the organization that deals with Palestinian refugees, was, to put it mildly, very uh, regrettable. Um, but we are finding ways around it, uh, and others are stepping up to the plate. And here I also want to use this um, question of yours to point out, which was also pointed out today by um, one of the panelists. Um, when you look at what's happening uh, in the United States, the president decides that he's going to leave the Paris Agreement. 30 seconds later, I don't know how many states, cities, individuals, businesses are telling him, no, you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, we're staying in this and we're going to do what we can. Mr. Mr. Bloomberg is paying the dues to the ICE, ICE Tribal Sea Secretariat, the U.S. dues, out of his pocket, which, you know, um, in many ways it was a decision that really um, reinforces what I was saying before in terms of the changing governance structures, because this was a massive shooting in the feet of the U.S. administration in terms of its legitimacy as the governing structure mm -hmm. of what was happening in the country because states and individuals are taking over and are saying, no, we're not going to do, go that way. Same with migration. And you see that, you see it in, in Hungary, for example, when they wanted to close the doors. C citizens in Hungary are, 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 give, are helping uh, people in need. Um, so there is this, and this is part of the change, this, uh, this taking responsibility by individuals and by the civil society, um, uh, which is really important, and which is, has to be turned also into activism. There is none of the problems that we face today are going to be solved by governments alone. It's simply not happening. It has to be a collective effort. Yes. Uh, hi. Hi. My name is Maria, and um, um, I see that um, after the World War II uh, League of Nations collapsed just because of people lost trust in it, and then the United Nations was created just to maintain peace and security and uh, the human rights in the world. Not just. Um, for all that reason, right? But then, what ha right, right now what I see, there are so many conflicts going on in Syria and, you know, uh, Burma and then Afghanistan and Kashmir, we see it was a long pending conflict that never resolved and we see cosmetic actions but never taken the real actions. And I see that the, the change comes from the top, not from the bottom. Like, the top is so powerful that the bottom can't do anything, can't, we can't move anything. In those countries? In those countries, and uh, see like India and Pakistan, I don't think Pakistan or Indian people hate each other, it's just the, the government, the way they operate, and they use uh, those tactics to, to uh, protect their corruption and all those things. So how United Nations can play a role in that, because I don't see anything happening, and all those politicians just come, come for a tea or coffee there, and nothing happens, and you see there is war going on in Syria, and nobody asks the United Nations, when you see Iran or Russia, they attack there, and then US attack there, uh, France, but nobody asks United Nations that we are going to do this. How are we going to change this? Like, United Nations, people are losing trust in it. Are you, United Nations, going to collapse or what? No. Thank you. Why don't you just hand the mic? Yes. Well, yeah, first of all, let Thank me just uh, make a slight historical correction to what you said. Uh, the League of Nations um, collapsed primarily because the United States was not a member. Mm -hmm. Big flaw, which we are very much trying to avoid happening to the UN. Because if the United States were to walk out, which sometimes its current president is hinting at that he may or did, um, we're going to have be facing the same problem. We have to have the United States inside the tent. We have to work with them, and they are very much a, a huge power that needs to be uh, brought into the. Field. It's also they, we have not been, as an organization, been very good at the at the, at the narrative about what we do, how we do it. Um, 
And it, your question also touches on the perennial problem of describing what the UN is. The UN is two things. It's a club with members, the member states who pay their dues, who set the agenda, who set our priorities, and who decide where and how we go to, do, to spend the money that they have given us. That's a political part and the sort of the, the, the reality part of the organization. The other part is people like me, the secretary, the people who actually do the work that we're being paid for to do, and which of course has a life on its own. The secretary general um, in, 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 is more than the sum of it, it is the moral, uh, the vocal um, manifestation, if you want, of the fact that, uh, that the UN is more than the sum of its parts. Um, and that is part of his role, the moral voice. Um, and some secretary generals use it well, some use it less well. It depends a little bit also on the political configuration and environment in which uh, they work. But it's also true that um, at a time of today where uh, at the political level the UN is uh, mar marginalized in most places simply because of these new political realities, we're doing a lot of stuff to help. Syria is probably the best example I can give you. While the Security Council is sitting on its hands and not doing anything in Syria, as they are supposed to, the, the UN family and its partners, including the Red Cross and others, are taking care of an extraordinary amount of people in terms of food, education, health. Millions and millions of people are still alive today because of these organizations going in and helping them, both inside Syria and outside Syria. The same is true in Yemen. Yemen has about 20 million people in need of food assistance and health assistance. With the refugees. Very often. How do you no, no, that happens, but that is a, that's, that's an example that, uh, that shows that the system is certainly far from perfect. I'm not trying to sell you a mm. bill of goods here, but I, I'm, what I'm telling you is that the system is doing a lot more um, than, uh, than it what is given, given credit for. I'm also, you have to also understand that a lot of the places that, um, and, and first of all, you also, the press never talks about the, 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 the positive things that, uh, that are happening. That's, just a fact of life. But the fact is, uh, let me put it, uh, uh, let's scale it up uh, differently and, and, uh, and I make the, the following claim, that if we close the doors of the UN today, you would have to reinvent it tomorrow because the, w the way the world is structured and the way it's fragmented right now and the way that it's working, it, you and everybody in this room would be a hell of a lot worse off in your daily lives if it wasn't for the UN. Mm. But the thing is that what UN can do better to bring all those politicians and agree to something that can actually bring change. We have we are looking for like SDG twenty thirty, but I don't think it's going it's moving anywhere. Your frustration is more than up. Your frustration is... It is moving, but anyway, yeah. there are others who will ask. Yeah. We can and talk I, afterwards. I'd just rather not monopolize. Um, just one remark from the humble perspective of a teacher. When students approach me with this question, what on earth can we do to make this thing more effective, the UN? One answer, if I may, one answer. Political organizations, international organizations, are just as effective as the shared political will of their members. You cannot blame the United Nations for things that cannot be accomplished because the major member states of the United Nations do not agree. We do not have world government. And short of world government, we depend on political will. And the political will of these structures just ends where the great powers agree. And you know, beyond that, it's, it's kind of mood to blame the United Nations for things that don't happen. Well, well, let me just answer that. One sure. way is to vote for better politicians, to start with. The second one Where is... Where are they? Sorry. Well, no, they're somewhere. Just, just, Maybe they're probably in this yeah. room, actually. Yeah. The second one is, the, is, comes back to the role of civil society. It's not just an issue of voting. It's yeah. an issue of putting up your voice and, in, and demanding that stuff happens. Which is what you're doing. Which is exactly what you're doing. So keep doing what you're doing. Next question, please. Hi, I'm from India. And um, 
I would dare to be a little bold and ask you a rather straightforward question, something I'm sure you get a lot of times. Uh, so I'm working in the social development sector for quite a few years, and for me and uh, youth in India who is involved in the same sector, it's a cherished dream to work with the United Nations. And we spoke a little, you spoke about how uh, we can be involved uh, in making this world a better place in small ways. I would like to divert your attention towards getting involved with the United Nations in a more direct way. And I want to know how do you think uh, youth can best get involved directly with the United Nations? How does the hiring process really work in countries such as India, where people still are quite optimistic about the United Nations and the work it does, and you know, consider it to be a dream job and they would you know, be very, very happy? Also, one more thing, like what, what kind of a person do you think is the best fit for working in the United Nations? Hmm. Thank you. We hire everything from priests to sinners. Um, it takes all kinds as we cover everything. Now, uh, it, the, the hiring practices of the different uh, organizations in the UN are not necessarily uh, in sync. So a lot of the specialized agencies, the technical agencies hire in certain ways. Um, uh, the secretariat hires in different ways. There are, um, most of it by now is happening online, which is a pain in the neck for most people because it's uh, really cumbersome and takes time and it's not particularly user-friendly. Um, but there, one, one way is to working to get a job, but the other one is also to work with them. And in fact, if I may, uh, particularly in countries like India, the place to work with and for and with the UN is on the ground. It's not in New York or in Geneva or in... A, it's, it's there. And this is where you need to engage um, at the level of the different representatives of these organizations um, in, uh, in India or in any other country that you're going to. Both through uh, voluntary work, through NGOs, through applying for jobs, most of these organizations hire at the, at the local level as well. It's not all happening. It's less and less happening at the central level. So I encourage you to keep trying. It's a long process. Uh, my name... Excuse me. My name is Oksana Grigorova. I came from Speak Russia. Speak up, please. Okay. My name is Oksana. I came from Russian Federation. And, but actually, my question is about uh, Africa again. So my question is that there are uh, several um, you know, policies towards uh, development, for example, democratic development, green economy, or health, or education. And so my question is, what do you think is the most effective and the second question is, uh, should be any kind of priority in help uh, to the countries, to the African countries, or it should be like reduced uh, the number of the countries to get this help? I didn't get the, the last question is whether we should concentrate on a few yes, instead yes. of all. Yes, true, okay. true. Well, the, the answer to your first, the first part of your question is that um, it's not one or the other. It's more and more, as I've said before in my intervention, uh, we, are try we are figuring out and, uh, to, uh, to ways of making sure that we do this in a, in, a, in a much more integrated way. So it's not just about health or uh, development or different kinds of models. It's really trying to find uh, um, how we are going to apply all of these with a much greater impact. And we have, structured, we have restructured ourselves as a system and also in terms of how we uh, act with partners. So you will no longer, when you go to any country um, in, in the world, and that will be refined again uh, now in the coming months, um, we are applying what we call a one UN approach. So you will have in one building all the organizations that are present in that country working together in a much more integrated way than we've done before. So it's both, as I said, a mindset change and also a structural change. Um, and it's clear uh, that um, we're already beginning to see the impact of this approach and the results are much more sustainable, much more deep, and uh, makes much more sense. But they also have to be aligned to the priorities of each of these countries. It's not a paternalistic approach where we come and think that we know best. It's certainly the other way around. So that is also a, a recalibration, if you want, where we're making sure that those country teams in each individual countries are fully aligned with the, with, with the priorities that have been set at the national level and working more and more with, um, with the local. Uh, so we have less and less internationals, more and more local people in these countries. 
um, because the previous top-down system uh, doesn't work as it should. Please, a man. You, you just speak up. Does not need does jobs. Not need job. And his argument was uh, since a country like Uganda is the most entrepreneurial country in the world, um, the private sector should actually make jobs by themselves rather than the public sector making jobs. Um, what's your thought on that? Are you going to support the public sector to create more jobs in terms of building infrastructure or more on the private side? I think it has to be both. I think we mentioned that earlier. And it was certainly also mentioned uh, um, in some of the talks today. I think I heard you ask a question earlier on this morning, no? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I think it has to be both. And I think that uh, the, 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 the sort of questions that were asked where people answered on the, 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 their cell phones, the answers were quite telling. Uh, job creation has to be uh, led uh, by a combination of business and uh, and, and government with the private sector leading, not the government's leading, because mm. if we want to be effective, at least at this stage of our history, this is a way to go. So I think it has to be both. I'm not quite sure that Uganda doesn't need uh, help in job creation. If it's true, fantastic. I think there are a number of countries um, that uh, are close to that situation, but there are equally quite a lot of countries that are, sim are clearly not. If you look at what's happening in the Maghreb and Northern Africa, where you have a youth unemployment of uh, 50 or 60 percent, um, uh, you have a problem. Um, and you, we need to help them get there, uh, but in, in a very organic and locally uh, organized way. Again, this is not about, yeah. it's about helping with education, it's about bringing some of the expertise that, uh, that the rest of the world has, but to help uh, local solutions uh, because they're the only ones that, that are not sustainable. So it has to be a partnership like most of, most of the stuff that we need to do. And, you know, partnership and perhaps division of labour and that job creation, as far as I'm concerned, would basically be, you know, the private sector. But the public sector could do a much better job than it has been doing in terms of the legal institutional complement. You know, you need a legal infrastructure for jobs. You need to bring the informal in Africa into the formal, you need, which means you need contracts, but that means you need the rule of law and so forth. Fruitful division of labor in the best of worlds. That would be nice. A lady, please. The mic, was, the mic is coming. Yes. Um, hello, I'm Lore, water specialist. I've been living in uh, Haiti for six years and working in uh, war conflict zones for the past 10 years. Um, on a more personal level, um, when you wake up in the morning, what are the three topics that uh, worry you most now until the end of the year 2018? Hmm. I served in Haiti as well. That used to worry me a lot. It still worries me. But uh, the three topics. Well, I can answer in many different ways. Um, let me answer in two ways. When I first uh, started this job four and a half years ago, I felt the need to uh, change a narrative about what we do so that people actually understood what we do and change. So I asked my colleagues um, and myself to boil everything we do into three words. And the three words I chose was peace, rights and well-being. And those, how, how we calibrate the system and push the system to deliver on those three is really our job, our daily, our daily job. So that's part of what I think about, and it's part particularly because one of the things that I've set up is what I told you about the SDG lab, but, it, but that is just a tool to figure out how I can help personally and use my position um, to uh, improve our ability to get everybody around the same table and act and work much better. That's one. And two is how do we, um, how do we explain what we do? How do we come up with a narrative that convinces people, individuals, of the relevance and the impact of what we do collectively on their, on your personal life? You know, if I stop somebody in the street and ask them, what does the UN mean in your life? Most of them will just run away. I want to change that because if we don't, 
the support for the system, which is really more and more needed right now, is going to fade away. And we are going to be in a place uh, that is uh, not good enough. Because it means that if the individuals are convinced of the utility and the importance of having a system that works for them in their daily lives, and the absence of which would mean that their, your daily life would be a lot worse, then that will filter up to the decision makers, to the, the, the resource allocators, etc. So I worry about that. I worry a lot these days about uh, disarmament. We haven't talked about that, but I'm, as, a, as, a, as a, uh, Christoph said, I'm a Secretary General of the Conference on Disarmament, a, um, a bizarre contraption that hasn't done much for the last 22 years, which, which just woke up a month ago and actually took a decision, um, and we're, they're now working again. Um, but the, and the aspect of that that I really worry about, because we're completely behind the curve, not we as the world, um, but encapsulated in the UN, um, uh, we have to figure out a way of sitting down and discussing and taking decisions on how we're going to regulate and inject some ethics into the use of technology, and particularly technology that's going to be used, uh, that has second uh, dual uses and is going to be used as weapons. We are looking at the prospect of a class of weapons that will be more scary and more impactful than nuclear weapons, if we're not careful. And they are, most of them are being developed, most of these technologies are being developed in the private sector with very little oversight uh, and very, with very little political understanding of the consequences uh, and the, 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 the speed and, 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 uh, and, and impact that all of these technologies are going to have on our lives, including as potential weapons. We need to sit down really fast and sit and discuss on how we're going to get there. It's beginning, but again, it's too slow. So I, I, I worry a lot about that. Um, the third one I worry about is a much more pedestrian thing, which not necessarily um, affect you, uh, but uh, one of the things I'm responsible for is the renovation of the whole uh, infrastructure of the UN in Geneva. It's a massive project, project um, that's going to take uh, ma many years and cost a lot of money. And I happen to be the project owner of that, and sure. the practical aspects of that are rather daunting. So that worries me a little bit in the morning. Climate change worries me. It should worry every one of you. That's number one, no question. Thank you. And the last question, the lady, please. Please stand up then and ask the question. And I, and I apologize to you. Please. Thank you. It's difficult to really, you know, be fair from sitting here and looking into the light. Sorry. Yeah, there of you go. course, no worries. I'm Mark, I'm studying your international first, and I would like to ask you, you mentioned several times about the communicative difficulties of the United Nations. The what difficulties? The communicative difficulties of the United Nations to make people understand uh, what the institutions are doing. The same is uh, true at the European level, where there, there is a disproportionate communicative power between uh, politicians at the national level and the European Union. How would you solve, in general, this uh, disproportion in uh, communication possibilities between international institutions and uh, the national ones? Thank you. Well, it's a shared problem, but it's a, you know, also a shared flawed solutions over the past many years. <coughs> in terms of the UN, uh, in terms of the EU, I'll give you an example of uh, the frustration I felt by precisely the problem that you were enunciated. I had. Uh, uh, Mr. Barroso in, uh, in my office some time ago after he left his office and um, I a little cheekily asked him the question how many times do you go into the street and talk to people? And he looked at me as if I fell from the sky um, and he hadn't. Now if you don't talk to the people you're supposed to help how can you possibly think that you're going to be communicating what the impact of what you do is having on your life? Um, so, and how do you, I mean, you have to change the way we speak, you have to change the, the tools that we use to speak, and we have to change the, also the audiences that we speak to. Uh, and this, I've been doing this uh, for, since I started this job, I created a small unit called the Perception Change Project, which had one goal, to change, to figure out how to tell the story in different ways. Um, and uh, I had some very great colleagues, most of them interns, because I don't have any money to pay for people. And um, uh, it actually helped, because the only, uh, the, the lady who was in charge of it was a very creative Chilean woman. 
And the only instruction I gave her when we started was that she could not hire anybody over 25 years old in that unit. Because we had to change the narrative, we had to change the way we speak, and we had to, and they did. Um, a small example, which was quite successful, the first product they came up with, they do a lot of things, but the first product they came up with was a book called Recipes for Peace, Rights and Wellbeing. And we asked all my colleagues in the different organizations to write on one piece of paper what their organization did in recipe form. Then people understood what these organizations were doing. All of a sudden people understood what ILO and WHO and WTO and all the other acronyms were doing. Um, so I'm just giving that as an example to show you that we have to really think completely differently in terms of the kinds of tools that we're using and we're beginning to do that. Uh, we are opening up a lot. Um, I, have, um, I have open days. The um, last one was last uh, October. We had 15,000 people walk into our park. The one before that had 20,000 people um, who suddenly walked into a place that they always thought of as a kind of ivory tower that was impregnable and uh, one, one couldn't do. The UN is the house of the people. It's your house. And you have a right to be there, you have to know a right to understand what we're doing. At the end of the day, you're the ones paying what, for what we're doing through your taxes. So this kind of, uh, the, the disconnect in relationship between what the system does and its leaders and its work and the, the citizens who are supposedly the beneficiaries of what we do has to be closed. And this is certainly what we're trying to do now. Um, we are trying, we're doing, I've just uh, cut a deal with a big advertising agency who's come up with some really cool um, uh, new campaigns that you will see soon uh, addressing your age group of what we do um, using social media and other uh, tools. So we're trying um, with um, modest success also because if we could scale it up it would be much better but we have to work with what we have. Um, but it's a very relevant question. Um, and, um, uh, and changing the understanding and the knowledge of what the system does um, is crucial. As I told you before, the, this ecosystem that the world has created that happens to be in Geneva, which is the operational hub of the international system to an extent that most people don't know, um, the stuff that comes out of the city every single day touches every single person on this planet several times a day in very practical terms. And it's not just the UN. I mean, your cell phones that you have in the parks wouldn't be working unless it was for at least four or five organizations in Geneva. The internet you're working on was, was invented at CERN, uh, you know, etc. Those who have kids, you put your babies in a car seat. The, the, the norms that govern how these car seats are being built so that you feel safe putting your baby there when you drive them around is stuff that has been determined on the second floor of the building that I sit in. Have you ever asked yourselves why uh, traffic signs are the same all over the world? Because at the time of League of Nations, a group of governments sat down and decided that the stop sign was going to look like this and that the blue sign with the white uh, arrow was going to look like this, etc. Stuff that touches you all the time and you don't know it, we take it for granted, um, etc. You know, the, the, the cost of everything that you wear, every single one of you, the, the, the value chain started at the World Trade Organization and the end result is that you're wearing it and you paid a certain amount of money for it, etc. There's plenty of these. When you brush your teeth in the morning, the amount of chemicals in your toothpaste, uh, the percentage of chemicals in that toothpaste is a norm that, was, that is set in my building as well. Uh, the size of brake pads on trucks, stuff, really pedestrian day-to-day -day stuff that we don't think about uh, happens in the millions of examples every single day. So much about convincing our students about the relevance of global governance. Time is up. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your interest. Thank you for participating. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.